Hello and welcome to NetWealth's Practice Management Webinar Series, designed to help wealth professionals dis discover new opportunities to enhance their business. My name is Josh Thomas, and today I'm joined by David Smorgan, CEO of CEO of Point Made and Executive Chairman of Generation Investments, who will be guiding us through how to successfully transition a family-owned business. Just before we get underway today, there's a few housekeeping items which I'd like to cover off. This webinar has been allocated one CPD point. To receive this CPD point, you must be listening for at least 30 minutes of today's webinar. The CPD point will be provided in a follow-up email uh, along with the slides and additional resources within a week of this webinar uh, airing. Questions will be live throughout the webinar. If you'd like to ask David a question, uh, please use the question panel in your GoToWebinar sidebar, uh, and we'll endeavor to answer all questions at the end of the session. If you're posting on social media regarding today's webinar, make sure you use hashtag NetWealthInvest and tweet at NetWealthInvest. So a little bit about net wealth, if you're not familiar with us, we're, at, we're currently in our 20th year. We're an ASX listed company who provides an online platform to support financial advisors with a wide range of financial products and services to help manage their clients' investments and superannuation. The key features of our product include a market leading advisor and client portal, a mobile app to help you and your clients access key information on the go, a wide range of investment options, and a suite of detailed reports that can be tailored to your clients and business needs. For more information about our product, please visit our website, netwealth.com.au. Well, it's with great pleasure today that I welcome uh, CEO of Point Made, David Smorgan. David's journey includes a myriad of life experiences from his early days as a lawyer and a grueling three-year apprenticeship in the family abattoirs to growing a $1 billion family business and steering a battling AFL club to survival and enduring personal tragedy. There is arguably no one better equipped to talk about family business, success, adversity, teamwork, and resilience. With that, I'd like to pass over to David to deliver today's webinar. Thank you, Josh, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's uh, firstly set the family business scene in Australia. 70% of Australia's 2.1 million businesses are family owned. I think in every industry, no matter what size, there's a family business that is making a difference and improving the economy of our country. Most family businesses are sophisticated, they're successful and they're smart. And one of the main reasons is it's their dollars. They care a little bit more when it's your dollars that are in there. However, currently, the baby boomers are having to face up to a decision. They're having to decide to discuss with their children and grandchildren, as the case may be, who's going to get what. And so at the moment, there is what I would say, an elephant in many family living rooms. The elephant in the room represents all the unspoken topics that are currently dismissed, avoided or deflected. What are some of these topics? Family assets, estate plans, who gets what, and generally any issue concerning money or wealth, regardless of the quantum. Most of us are poor, communicator, poor communicators when it comes to these sensitive, personal and difficult issues. So why is it? Why is it so difficult to have difficult discussions with loved ones on these topics? My experiences of working and assisting with families in business 
over the last 10 years confirms very strongly that there's a growing crisis in Australia as we the baby boomers are playing in the last quarter of our lives and we have an inability to plan, decide and discuss with our children more and more creating divisions within the family. Discussing money, assets and liabilities is a difficult, sensitive and personal issue. However, we avoid conversing about these issues at our peril. In fact, the first stage of successfully transitioning your family business or your family wealth is to become an effective and regular communicator. Because in your family, if you're not doing that, there will be different expectations, different sense of entitlements, a potential disconnect between the generations, disconnect between the siblings, and often differing views on values and vision. You all would be familiar with the Rich List. Comes out yearly and details lots of successful men and women that are making and have made a major contribution to our community. We need to congratulate them. We need to learn from them and applaud them for their achievements in a financial sense. However, why are so many on the rich list on what I've now labeled the fractured family list. The fractured family list, which contains too many people that unfortunately are realizing that wealth is a burden and not a benefit. That wealth is corrosive and divisive. That wealth is not the glue that keeps the family together. And more importantly, that wealth on its own will not buy happiness. So these are some of the reasons why families around Australia are imploding and failing for family reasons and not just for business reasons. Some of the principles that we adopt at Point Made, which is important to understand, that wealth of your family is not just your balance sheet or your P&L account. The wealth of your family is actually each and every family member that sits around your table. The critical challenges for families arrive from wanting a harmonious, united and happy family. It's amazing that the greater majority of our clients start with us by this simple request. I just want all the kids to come around on Father's Day at the same time. I just want them to sit around the Christmas table or the Passover table and not not turn up because they're upset with me or their, their mother, or their sibling, or their in-law. Why is it so difficult? Ironically, in our experience, most of these challenges are relationship and family based. And yes, of course, money is generally a factor, but money is not gonna solve the issue. The way to improve the relationships in your family is to focus on improving the dynamics in your family as expressed by the way they communicate with each other, by the way they deal with each other, talk to each other and make decisions with each other. And so often we see the business is very professionally run. It's professionally structured, it's got a strategy, it's got a plan, and yet the family, which gets probably 1% of investment time, is very amateurish. And so we say, if you're serious about achieving a harmonious and a happy family, then you've got to professionalize the family in the same way as you'd probably professionalize your business. And therefore, the way to do that is, you must devote a similar, not the same, a similar amount of time and effort and resources into improving the health of your family as evidenced by the communication, by the relationship and that exists within the family. And of course, you need to think long-term for your family's aspirations. This is not just about today and tomorrow, it's about the next five, 10, 15 years. And we say that the quality of our lives is primarily determined by the quality of our family relationships. The quality of our lives, frankly, is not determined by how much money we have. I had a guy in the other day that said, David, I'm three times as rich, but I'm not happier because I still don't have a close, meaningful relationship 
with some of my children. And so, how best to successfully manage a generational transfer of a family business? And for this purpose, it might be the family investment portfolio. It doesn't necessarily have to be an active operating business. It could be your investment portfolio. The first thing I do is start now because succession is a process and not just a single event. Sadly, so many of our clients in their 70s and 80s come to us and say, I'm still active, I'm still the executive chairman, I'm still the CEO of our family business, I still call the shots and I'm fit and I'm well and I'm not gonna let go till I'm 90. That's an attitude, it's not for us to say that's not right. However, when that individual gives us the opportunity to talk to their children, and their children in this case might be in their 50s or 40s or even into their 60s, they're waiting for an opportunity to express themselves. They don't wanna wait until their father or mother is in their 90s. They don't understand that it takes a long time to understand what are the attributes about a successor, a successor that are so important. It's a process, so you need to start now. You need, then need to build what we would call a family pyramid. Because like the Egyptians did thousands and thousands of years ago, you've got to build a solid family foundation from the ground up. If you look at this pyramid, let's start down the bottom of what we have labeled the guiding principles. Basically, do you as a family have a vision? Do you as a family have a set a commonly agreed set of values and understand what's the purpose of your family investment or your family business. For a successful family that wants to leave a legacy, that wants to leave something the more than just money, this requires involvement and participation by all family members. Try your best to give every one of your children and grandchildren as appropriate a voice around the table and a voice that is heard in a safe environment, that's not gonna be yelled at, not gonna be put down, not gonna be told what would you know. The family that's together starts down at the bottom with a common vision, common values, and a common set of purpose. As you work, you develop a family culture. In our experience, every family business, every family by itself has a different culture, has a different way of doing things. You would know how you communicate with each other. You would know how you make decisions and you could put an assessment together of how your relationships are. Communication is the essence of keeping a family together. Communication is not just saying, good morning, how are you? How was your day and moving on? They need to be effective. They need to be meaningful. And it's the same with your relationships. And we would say you cannot have a meaningful relationship until you have a meaningful connection with all of your family members. And at the top of the pyramid is what we would call the governance. How do we do things around here? What structures are in place? Do you have a family board? Do you have a business board? Do you have a family constitution or a charter that explains what the rules are for our family? For example, who can come into our family business? What do they need to bring into the family business? An offer that's bring in more than your surname, bring in outside experiences, bring some successes, bring some failures, bring some attribute that's not currently existing in our family business. When you're in the family business, what are you gonna get paid? Who determines your salary? Who's gonna be your boss? Etc. 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 So there's a Chinese proverb that goes along the lines of, the, the palest of ink is better than a distant memory. Let me just say that again. The palest of ink is better than a distant memory. Because sadly, so many of our clients don't have anything in writing. It's all in their head. And what happens when it's in their head? It's then open to interpretation. It's open to different children having a different perspective and different view of what mum or dad may have meant. And so it becomes critical to put things down in writing.
As you build your family pyramid, the critical importance, as I've just said, about connection leading to communication is critical because what does that do? It builds trust. You cannot afford in your family not to have absolute trust between all family members. Trust means being consistent. Trust means doing what you say you're going to do. So if you've got the words right, then you need to implement them so that you can create trust, knowing that we don't have to second guess. And the other attribute to successfully manage a generational transfer is you've got to put time into your children. Simply because they've got your surname doesn't mean they're going to be as good as you. The necessity to treat your kids as your asset implies that there's a responsibility to coach them, to educate them, to mentor them, and to give them a chance of expressing themselves and pursue their own passions. And frankly, we're not concerned if those children don't want to necessarily follow in the same footsteps or follow in the same shadow that mum and dad have created. You have to, in our experience, give your children the opportunity to follow their own dreams, their own passions, and create their own foot footprints and their own shadow. And you do this by creating the appropriate structure and governance that is going to work for you. The structure might be creating a business board, the necessity to have one or two independent people on that board that will go where you're not prepared to go, particularly where it relates to your children. And governance means things are in writing. Things are done, T's are crossed, I's are dotted. And there might be a necessity in most families to have what we would label as a family board, a family meeting where 95% of the time the discussion is about family issues, not about the business issues. And the way you do that is to create some rules for the family meeting that are shared to and understood by all family members. So for example, we would always facilitate a family meeting by starting off with putting on the board the rules for today. Number one, we listen to each other. We respect each other. Different views are allowed. There's no raised voices. Everyone has an equal say. Obviously confidentiality and mobile phones and all those other routine things. And it's up to the facilitator, the important role that the independent chairperson plays. And let me issue a word of warning here. You cannot successfully chair your own family meetings. We are too biased. We're too, we're too blinkered in terms of dealing with our children to chair those family meetings. The necessity of having an independent, trained person that is used to dealing with families, that is there for the benefit of each and every family member becomes critical in the success of having family meetings. And family meetings should be held on a regular basis. In some complex families with lots of issues, it's probably appropriate they be held monthly. In other cases, you can hold them quarterly or as appropriate, but they need to be regular. You just can't say, oh, we'll have one family meeting a year and everything will be hunky-dory. It ain't that simple. And as I said earlier, you've got to be regular and they have to be effective and they've got to be good connectors and communicators. And so in summary, you must prepare a succession plan, a comprehensive succession plan that takes into account the three hats that you wear as the owner, as the parent, as a family member, as an owner, and from a management perspective. Those three hats have to all be in sync. The succession plan has to be strategic. It's got to take into account the family views as well as where the business is at today. And of course, it's got to be feasible. It's got to be realistic. You cannot anoint a child of yours to take over from you if they haven't been trained, if they haven't had the experience, if they haven't ticked nine or 10 out of the 10 boxes that a CEO or chairman of a family business has to, has to tick to be successful. So what are some of the unique traits 
and challenges that within the family business sector. I've been involved with family businesses one way or another for more than 40 years and I had the privilege of working and assisting with 300 high net worth individuals and or families for the past seven years. And I can generalize by saying there are six things that most families don't do. So as I go through this, I'd like you to just think about where you're at with your family and see how you would go on some open, honest assessment of where your family's at. The first don't is most of us don't spend enough time on family issues as compared to business issues. It's easy because business drives the wealth of the family. Business drives the dividend flow, the salary, the, 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 the dividends that we all get. And so it's natural that most of the time is spent on business issues. However, if you want to have a happier, a more harmonious family, a family that thinks together, that eats together, that laughs together, you have to simply put time in your diary for what I label as family issues. It's not brunch on a Sunday. It's not having the occasional catch up coffee. They are social issues, they're social discussions. Family issues mean sitting down, often one on one, sometimes with the rest of your family on a regular basis to give of yourself to nurture them, to support them, to pat them on the back and kick them in the ass as appropriate. It's time on family issues. It won't happen by itself. Number two, it's similar lines. We don't discuss wealth with our children on a regular and effective basis. Regardless of the wealth, what do you think your children are thinking about when you are not discussing wealth with them? I'll tell you what, because I have the privilege of working with a lot of children, and they'll say to me with regularity, David, mum and dad don't trust me. Why do you say that? Because they never talk about our wealth. I know where we live, I know how we live, I know the cars we drive, I know the holidays we take, I know roughly the business, I can read the rich list, and by the way, it's not just those hundreds of people on that rich list. There are thousands of others that are wealthy from a financial point of view that we don't know their names, that are not on the rich list, that this applies to. And so you've got to, you should be able to, to talk to your children about wealth on a regular and effective basis, regardless of what the wealth is. Because your kids, if you're not, probably will be saying, mum and dad don't trust us. Similarly, number three, most parents are not training or educating their children about wealth or business. Just because they've got your surname doesn't mean they're going to be good. Wealth alone, wealth alone will not give your children a strong sense of purpose or direction in their life. And it really is tragic that so many youngsters coming from wonderful family homes, from wealth that more money than they know what to do with, these kids are going down a different path because in our experience, we are not spending enough time with them to explain who we are, what we stand for and where we're going as a family. And these parents think that wealth will cure all the problems. It won't. What will help you is spending time with them, asking them for their views, asking for their inputs, patting them on the back, as I said earlier, when they deserve it. Why is it so hard for people to say, well done, son. I'm proud of you, my daughter. And it's so easy to kick them in the backside and continually criticize them and put them down. Change your attitudes towards your children and you will see the benefits very quickly. Number four, as I said earlier, most families don't understand that succession is a process and not an event. You can't wait till you're 85 to start talking about what are the attributes of someone that is going to have to replace me. At the age of 55, 65, that is the right stage of life to start talking about it because it takes time. It isn't an easy process. And I'll shortly show you a slide where there's five or six reasons why people defer and put succession off for a whole range of may be relevant reasons, but you do so at your peril. The fifth generalization, we're not good at dealing with conflict. 
we keep conflict in the cupboard. Or put it another way, we keep it in that suitcase that we carry. And every one of us, every single one, no matter what hat you wear, as a parent, as a child, as a grandchild, as an in-law, we've all got stuff that we're not happy about. Because let's face it, tensions and disagreements within families are natural. However, conflict may be predictable, but it's not inevitable in a family. If you have the opportunity to create a structure, to have a process in place where all your family members under a safe environment can unpack their suitcase, can get rid of the stuff in a sensible, reasonable way to express their disappointment, to express their anger, to express their opinion in a controlled, safe environment that is by far the best way to reduce the con re not only reduce the conflict, but get rid of the conflict because otherwise it's staying in that suitcase and it's going to stay there until I see something that really turns me into a lunatic and I'm going to start raising my voice, bang the fist on the table, and of course, what's going to happen? Someone else from the family is going to respond the same way and bang their fist on the table. And before you know it, there's a family blow up and mum and dad leave and everyone's left alone. Hello, welcome to the real world. We don't deal with conflict and it's quite fascinating in our experience of having the honour and privilege of working with some tycoons, men and women, larger in life characters, worth billions. They're also conflict avoiders. When it comes to hard decisions, it's amazing that I've heard from their children and others that work with them, both in the family, in the business, they are conflict avoiders and they'll delegate that job to others. Well, hello, if you want a family that is together in unison, you've got to show some leadership and you've got to deal with conflict. And the last aspect, which I think we've talked about before, don't underestimate the importance of good governance. Good governance is belt and braces. Good governance is there for the protection of every family member, no matter what stage of life they are on. Put things down in writing because we all forget things. So there are six things, six issues that in my experience over many years of doing this, most families don't do. And yet they're not that difficult. Everyone should be able to be dealing with all of those issues if there's a commitment and if there's buy-in and if you show, show some appropriate leadership. But it's obviously not happening because have a look at the next slide. This is a global statistic. 70% of wealth transitions fail. And sadly, the origins lie within the families themselves. That is a very sad statistic, but it is a worldwide statistic. And of the 70%, 60%, why do you think they fail? Exactly what we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes or so. They fail because there's a breakdown in communication and trust within the family. It's not about their business. It's not anything about the numbers or the finances or their wealth or the quantity. It's a failure because of a breakdown in communication and trust within the family. And often it's not there even in the first place. So I ask you, I urge you, do your own self-assessment of your family. Do you talk openly? Do you talk about all issues? Do you download of what really matters to you? Do your kids understand that? Does your spouse understand that? 25% Failed due to inadequately trained heirs. What we've just been talking about. Something happens. Inevitably, it happens at the wrong time. And someone passes or is incapable of running a business and all of a sudden, it's handed down to the next generation. And surprise, surprise, well, we've never been involved in the business. We've never talked about the business. We've never had training. We've never had coaching. And of course, what do they do? They don't know what to do. And then they've got to go and find a trusted advisor to help them put on the, on the right path. And often that leads to disaster. And what happens is the wealth is never successfully transferred down to them. They've lost that opportunity. There's another reason why they fail. And finally, the last 15%, which should never happen, but unfortunately does, 
if they fail for a range of reasons, tax reasons, legal, or just poor advice. And if you want to read a book about this, it's Williams and Presser, Preparing Heirs. It's not just a book on, uh, about Australia, it's about the global statistics. So this, these figures are staring us in the eye when we're talking about why do wealth transitions fail. Very basic, very real. I mentioned earlier, why do people avoid talking about succession planning, which goes to the very essence of a family continuity? Because it raises, firstly, some very unpleasant family issues. You're asking me to make a decision about which child is going to take over from me. You're asking me to anoint one and not the other. Well, I can't do that because I love them all. I love them all equally. But that's not the point when you're running a family business or a family investment portfolio. There's got to be a boss. Someone's got to take charge. Someone's got to lead. And yes, it is a difficult exercise, but it's the reason why people put it off and why men and women in their 70s and 80s, as I said earlier, are still waiting and waiting and waiting. And then the inevitable happens and all of a sudden there'll be a shit fight in the family because we don't know what mum and dad's real intentions are. Succession forces people to confront their mortality. I don't like talking about that. Come back to me in five years or 10 years time. How dare you talk about that? Because I'm fit and I'm healthy and I'm well. I love doing what I'm doing day to day. Don't ask me to sit down and do a plan. It's not my comfort zone. You're trying to take over. You're trying to start to control me. What am I going to do? I don't have anything to do because this business is my life and my life is my business. Have you heard that before? I'm not interested in playing golf or bridge or traveling. My life is my business. How dare you think I can't go there every day? And so the suffering of loss and control is another impact on the owner. And of course, it follows on that the owner at 70, 80, 90 years of age, fears that a succession plan is going to reduce their options. What am I going to do? And lastly, they don't know how to plan because they've never planned anything in their life. And so these are some of the reasons we've got to overcome. And the best way, the global experience, best research way says, you deal with this, as I said earlier, by having family meetings as compared to board meetings. You have family meetings with an independent trained facilitator to deal with some of these issues that takes the emotion away from it, that still pays respect to the family attitudes and culture, but develops together with all family members a way forward. That is by far going to be the most successful way. If you don't do that, if you think by doing more of the same, it's going to inevitably end up in failure because there's simply not enough appropriate and effective communication through poor connection, which leads to a breakdown of trust between parent as generation one and the children in generation two and generation three. And just finally, family tensions are natural and normal. You wouldn't be a normal family if there weren't differences of opinion, if there weren't tensions, if there weren't disagreements. But the critical thing is, how do you become, how do they, you stop them from becoming conflict? Because conflict is where there's a threat, where there's a threat to the needs, the interests and the concerns resulting from individuals that differ in attitude, belief or values. Just go back to my pyramid. The critical first stage of developing your pyramid is to get common agreement by involving in effective communications and discussions with everyone around the table about having common beliefs, common values and common attitudes. Therefore, when that is achieved, there's a much better chance that your needs will be consistent with the interests and the concerns of all other family members. The difference between a disagreement and conflict, it's very important to understand, are the negative and lingering emotions. Because every one of us has gone through anger, have fears, have felt guilt and shame and jealousy, resentment, whatever the case may be. 
It's there. And simply because we're wealthy doesn't mean we deal with these things any better than someone that hasn't got any wealth. And you as wealthy owners, if you're not understanding that your family have got some of those issues of anger, of fear, of guilt and shame, and you don't create the safe environment where they can be discussed, what happens? All those issues stay in the suitcase. They stay in the cupboard. And they'll only come out when we see something that really tips us over the edge. And so the question is, can we get the parties to agree that it's not as important to be right as it is to reach genuine understanding and agreement to move forward. Just because we're the parents, just because we have more of a say, just because we may have been the wealth creators, doesn't mean we are always right. So often, the children have a much greater clarity an understanding of what to do as compared to their parents, but the parents think they know best. Well, sadly, matter of factly, father and mother sometimes do not know best. Give your children the opportunity to have their say. So get the parties to agree to a process to understand themselves before they try and solve all the problems. And you do that, as I said earlier, by setting up a family structure with all the appropriate processes. And family meetings, as we've said, that's where you unpack your suitcase. And lastly, don't underestimate the critical role of having a trusted independent chairman as your facilitator, as an advisor, that is there for the benefit of each and everyone, not just for the mum and dad. The role of that facilitator is to make sure that everyone has a voice in that safe environment. I feel from my own experiences that if you can spend time with your family, that if you really want to commit to helping train, educate, coach your children, if you start dealing with the succession plan early on, if you have an ability to deal with conflict and you've got the appropriate structure in place, there's absolutely no reason why your family can't be leaving a legacy. Not many families, unfortunately, are able to do that. But if you have an interest in family harmony and unity and continuity, hopefully today's presentation has given you some ammunition that you can fire off and make sure that you and your family do everything you can to achieve what you want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, well, listeners, uh, I hope that provided you with some uh, food for thought around working with family businesses and helping these businesses through the success succession process. We're actually lucky enough to record a, a podcast with David earlier today uh, for our Between Meetings series. So we'll hope to publish both of these uh, contents around the same time. The podcast was great because it gives you a little bit more background to, to David and, and the fantastic career that, that he has had. We'll jump over to some questions uh, now that have, that have come through. It's not too late to submit some questions just log in via the, uh, the questions panel on your GoToWebinar, and we'll endeavor to, uh, to answer as many as we can. Any questions that we don't get to, I'll pass on to, to David to, to follow up with um, another time. So the first two questions, uh, I could probably pass all these, these together into the one. David, what would be the first thing you would do walking into a family business that is fracturing? And what are the key learnings from working with fractured families or fr fractured family businesses over the years? The first thing I would do coming into uh, a family business that someone had told me has got a fractured family was to meet with the, um, the parents, let's assume it's mum and dad are in there with their children. Let's keep it simple like that. Although families are never simple. There's no such thing as a normal family. There's always a blended family today, but let's just accept the mum and dad and the kids. The most important thing would be to understand what do they want to achieve? What really matters to you would be my first question. And let's assume for this purpose, they don't want a fractured family. They actually want to be on the same page. 
I would then take the opportunity of saying the way to go about this, we would need to spend some time individually with each and every family member to peel back the layers and for them to share with us the same as I'm asking the parents, what really matters to you? What are the concerns? What's your vision for the family? What are the values that are important to you? And when you have the opportunity to speak to every single family member, you then can put down what are the things, the issues that connects them and what are the areas that divide them? And that's what you've got to then go to work on. And then by a process of going back and forward, and then at the appropriate time, bringing the family together and explaining to them exactly what you've heard. And obviously you protect confidentiality because otherwise people are not going to be open and honest to you. But if you're able to protect that confidentiality, the common themes and the common issues that divide them, that becomes a talking point. And that would lead then to another discussion about values and vision, which you need to create, um, I keep using that word, the safe environment, to give everyone a voice. And once you've got the words there, then you get a common vision and values that then drives actions, behaviours of the family. And you'd work out a family plan. And so if governance was an issue, if there was no structure in place, you'd be looking at what structures are relevant for this business. If there was no succession plan, you'd be working with the parents to work on a succession plan. You'd be working with the children that might need coaching or mentoring or et cetera, et cetera. And it's a process. And what I would do is, encourage them to start having family meetings with an independently trained facilitator. Don't try and do it yourself because it's going to fail with an independent trained facilitator that is going to give everyone a voice and that way you start having family unity. Family unity and continuity just doesn't happen. You've got to spend the time and effort on it. So that's the thing, the basics that I would do. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope that answers uh, that, that question. The second question was, Maybe I didn't the second that. question was around, I guess, key learnings that you've had over your career, you know, with the various family businesses that you've worked with, um, from working with Fractured Family, sorry, what, what are the key learnings that you were able to take away that you could perhaps part on? on those yes, I think the, the simple answer to that question is a staggering amount of ineffective and poor communication. Um, that continues continues to amaze me with almost every client that I have the privilege of working with. They say they're good communicators, but when you start deep diving, they're not good communicators at all. And frankly, too many parents aren't to communicate about those issues that they're comfortable with. They don't want to talk about estate plans. They don't want to talk about our wealth. They don't want to talk about succession plans. They're in the bus, they're in the, in, in the bag, in, in, in the suitcase. And so that would be my first uh, general impression. Secondly, my other uh, second thing would be um, the inability of children to um, get to influence their parents without threatening them. Um, and often I blame here the parents more than I do the children. Often we're dealing with people that are so fixated on their own self Narcissistic behaviour is quite common in a lot of family businesses, particularly when someone has started the family business from the ground up, has not had a formal education and done it their way. And so my aim would be, I don't want you to be a general because that's not sustainable. I want you to be like a conductor of an orchestra. They may play to your tune, but they're playing in sync with you as the boss. That is a good family, to be the conductor of the symphony rather than just being the general, do it my way or the highway. Thank you, David. Uh, I hope that answers the second part to, to that question. Uh, David, many of our listeners today are financial advisors or working within an advice practice. Um, this question came through, to what extent could, or what extent can financial advisors be involved in the management of family businesses in that succession process? And if perhaps they don't currently possess the skills to be effective in that, in that transition process, does Point Made offer training or additional resources to help you essentially upskill and, and be effective in that space? The answer to the last question is no, we don't. Uh, our hands are full at the moment working with with families, but it sounds like there might be a business opportunity there to train the advisors. I've, I'm a big believer is we've all got our comfort zones. And um, I, uh, my experience with families over the last 10 years has been, unfortunately, there's been a lot of 
very skilled, capable people giving very poor advice on family matters. Um, a lot of them are investment bankers, as an example. Um, a lot of them could be uh, financial advisors. And my suggestion would be you stick to doing what you do. I don't give advice. I don't give financial advice. I don't give them banking advice. I deal with helping them achieve their objective as long as it's to do with family harmony and continuity and unity and all those nice words that I've been e e explaining about. Um, it's very difficult to become um, an expert on the qualitative sides of life. If you're not comfortable about asking someone what's keeping you awake at night, what are your issues that really matter to you? Tell me about your children and what you're really concerned about. You're getting into very difficult areas. And most of us are much more comfortable with the quantity side of life, which I imagine most financial advisors would be. You're talking about numbers, margins, returns. That's your sweet spot. To go in the other area, I'm not sure that your clients are going to be comfortable about you going into this area because you're stepping out of your comfort zone. Now, there's obviously some exceptions. There's obviously some people that are able to do it. But in my general experience, I'm now talking about investment bankers and bankers in particular, stick to what you know and let others do what we do. Well, I guess that, that leads well into an, another question that, that came through. Where, where, do you find, where do you find an individual to perhaps push into that role to help a, a family business through that succession process if, as, as a financial advisor, you don't quite have those skills. Is there, could you recommend a, a firm or a business or a solution to, to solving that? Uh, I think there are many options there, um, uh, whether they be the large professional services firms, mid-tier accounting firms, uh, some lawyers say they do that. But again, I'm talking from my own experiences here. A lot of them play around the boundary line and they're not in the center square. And if you're not in the centre square of a family, if you're not really truly understanding what the motivations, what the concerns, what the worries are within all family members, you'll continue to play around the boundary line. And when the proverbial happens, it's not going to be the answer. And so therefore, notwithstanding there are a lot of people doing this, uh, a lot of people, frankly, have not had the success they want, as evidenced by the number of families that are imploding as a result of a lot of people making phone calls to, to me and us at Point Made, because just having a document that is well written and it can't fault it and it's crossed off Smith and put on Smorgan is not going to cut it for me. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, David. One, one final question uh, and then we'll wrap up. 16 years as the president of the Western Bulldogs, um, what, what's your outlook for, for 2020? I'm glad in a family business session, we've still got an opportunity to talk about footy. It wouldn't be Melbourne, would it? Uh, or Australia for that matter. Um, I'm very bullish about the Bulldogs. I always have been, even when we finished down with a wooden spoon, I've always knew there was next year. And I think looking forward to next year in 2020, given the, uh, the recruits we've got and given the way we finished off last season, I think we've regained our hunger. And if I was a betting man, and I'm not, um, uh, I'll be back in the Bulldogs to do very well, certainly top four, and who knows. As I said to, um, as my father used to say to me, you aim for the moon, you might hit the top of the cow shed. So we've got to aim for a premiership and hope all wells after that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, listeners, thank you very much for, for joining us today. That concludes the, the webinar. Uh, just touching on the CPD points, uh, these will be allocated within the next week uh, in a follow-up email, which will also include uh, today's webinar slides and perhaps some additional resources that uh, we could potentially include along that way. Um, we're, we're currently putting together... Okay, I'll, I'll also provide uh, David's email address if you'd like to reach out for David uh, to David for some additional information. We're currently putting together the 2020 schedule for this webinar series along with our portfolio construction series. So make sure you look out for an email um, January with our, our next speaker. With, this, uh, with the school year wrapping up, it's not too late to be involved in, in Banker. 
Banker is our uh, way of supporting financial literacy in schools. You can simply refer a teacher to the program by going to the Banker uh, website. There's currently 8,000 odd sponsored students. I believe there is 11,000 odd schools involved in that program uh, across Australia. So it's a terrific program. That wraps up today's webinar and the webinars, webinars for the rest of this year. Uh, have a great break and we'll see you guys in 2020.